We're in a revolution. And I think everyone who is conscious at all is aware of that fact. It's not a bloody revolution, it's not an armed revolution, but it's a revolution nevertheless and one that is acutely real, that touches the lives of every Christian. It's called by the media a moral revolution. Now as Christians, we're very much concerned about moral issues. And we see that ethics as a science is not something that emerges simply in the scheme of things evolutionarily in the course of history, but that ethics properly comes as a subheading underneath the discipline of theology. Now, part of the issue of our culture today has to do with the confusion, I think, of the relationship between ethics and morality. I want to take some time to go to the board here to outline some things about the word ethics and the word morality, things that are often overlooked by the Christian public. I think that you will find in your vocabulary and as you listen with your ears to the talk of the people in the street, that you will find that most people use the words ethics and morality interchangeably, as if they were exact, identical synonyms. But historically and classically, that's not been the case. The word ethic or ethics and the word morals or morality come from a different source. They derive from a different word. And the derivatives of these two terms have a difference that's very important for the Christian to understand. Let's look at that now for a minute. The word ethic or ethics comes from the Greek word ethos. The word morals or morality comes from the word mores. What's the difference? Well, the ethos of a society or of a culture deals with its underlying foundational philosophy, its concept of values, its system of understanding how the world fits together so that there is a, a philosophical value system that is the ethos of every culture that society em embraces. Mores, on the other hand, has to do with the customs and the habits and the normal forms of behavior that are found within a given culture or a given society. Now let's further delineate the difference between an ethic and a morality between ethos and mores. In the first instance, ethics is called a normative science. It's the study of norms, of standards by which things are measured or evaluated. Morality, on the other hand, is what we would call a descriptive science. A descriptive science is, as the name suggests, a science that's task is simply to describe the way things happen to operate or behave. If we take our column down a little bit uh, further, we will see that ethics are concerned with the imperative and morality is concerned with the indicative. What do we mean by that? Well, we'll take it one more notch to clarify it. Ethics is concerned with oughtness. Morality is concerned with isness. Now look at the chart again. Ethics or ethos is normative, imperative. It deals with oughtness. Morality comes from mores, which is descriptive and is concerned with the indicative or what we call isness. That is, that morality describes what people actually do. But the study of ethics, classically and historically, is concerned not so much with what we actually do, but rather with what we ought to be doing. Now that's a very significant difference, particularly as we understand it in light of our Christian faith. And also, 
in light of the fact that the two concepts are confused and merged and blended in our contemporary culture. What has come out of the confusion of ethics and morality is what I call the emergence of statistical morality, where the normal becomes the normative. Well, what do I mean by that? The normal becomes the normative. Well, here's how it works. To find out what is normal, we do a statistical survey. We take a poll. We count noses. We find out what people are actually doing. And suppose, for example, we find out that a majority of teenagers are using uh, marijuana. And we say, well, at that, this point in history, it is normal for an adolescent in the American culture to indulge in some, to some degree in the use of marijuana. And since a statistical majority do it, then we conclude that it is normal. And if it is normal, it is therefore what? It's good. It's human. And after all, what we want to be is human. And so through counting noses, through making the statistical survey, we discover the present trends and the present behavioral practices of a society, and then we urge the rest of the people to fall in line and participate and echo the acceptable standards of the given society. And so, with that word acceptable, I'm going back to the board again for a moment and say that, the, that ethics are concerned ultimately with what is right. Morality is concerned with what is accepted. Now, obviously, if something is accepted, it is therefore judged to be right by a given society or by a given culture. But the principal concern there is the present standards of an ongoing society. Now, as I say, this provokes a crisis for the Christian. Because when the normal becomes the normative, when what is determines what ought to be, we are in an exact flip-flop situation from the biblical ethic to which we are called. The motto, the slogan of statistical morality is a, is a strange and unusual combination of the indicative and the imperative. I'm sure you've all heard this statement, be what you are. Do you see the conjunction there? Be what you are, that's imperative. The be is the imperative. What you are is the indicative. We've merged ethics and morality. Now that would be fine if we lived in a society where every human being was morally and ethically perfect. Then indeed, such as in heaven, I would see that it would be appropriate to hear the voice of God coming to the residents of heaven and say simply, be what you already are, because there we would be in a state of glorification. But we live, according to the scriptures, in a fallen world, in a world that has been corrupted by the intrusion into it of evil. And so we must resist with all of our passion the temptation to accept the status quo, to be what we are. For until each one of us has arrived at the fullness of the measure of Christ in conformity to his image, if we remain what we are, we remain less than what God wants us to be. And so for us, there is a difference between what is and what ought to be. Therefore, the Christian concept of ethics is on a collision course with much of what is being expressed as, as morality in our contemporary society. Because we do not determine the right or the wrong on the grounds of what everybody else is doing. If we study, for example, the statistics, we will see that all men at one time or another 
practice dishonesty. Survey children in the grade school and see how many of them have ever cheated on an examination. That this is so widespread, so well nigh universal, that the Bible itself says that all men are liars. That doesn't mean that all men lie all the time, but that all men have indulged in dishonesty at some time or another. Well, if we look at that statistically, we would say that 100% of people indulge in dishonesty. And since it's 100% universal, statistically overwhelming, we should come to the conclusion then that it's perfectly normal for human beings to tell lies. Not only normal, but perfectly human. And if we want to be anything that's fully human, then we should encourage ourselves in the direction of dishonesty. Of course, that's what we call a reductio ad absurdum argument, where we take something to its logical conclusion and show the folly of it. But that's not what usually occurs in the culture. Those kinds of obvious problems with developing a statistical morality are often overlooked. The Bible says that we are tend, as, as fallen people, to dishonesty, yet we are called to a higher plane, and that we are called to live under the principle of the sanctity of truth as God sets before us in His Word. So keep that in mind as we go through this course, that there is a disjunction in our culture between living according to what is acceptable or expedient or what is pragmatically uh, important for peer acceptance or living according to principle. As Christians, the character of God supplies our ultimate ethos, the ultimate framework or foundation by which we discern and discover what is right and what is good and what is pleasing to Him. Now, in this brief course on principles of Christian ethics, we're going to try to get a, a handle on some of those principles that go beyond contemporary uh, taboos or contemporary mores or behavioral patterns that are acceptable or not acceptable, to look for those principles that transcend the relativity of culture to look for those principles that, as I said a moment ago, are resting ultimately in the character of God Himself, because the Christian is called to live according to principle, not according to expediency. That's part of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Now, when it comes to the quest for righteousness that is every Christian's duty, there are fundamentally only two problems. Those two problems are, are very weighty and significant, and, and the solution to those problems are anything but easy, but we can simplify it at least at the outset, saying there are two fundamental problems for the Christian as he struggles with ethical principles. The first problem is simply to know what the good is, to understand with the mind what it is that God requires, what it is that is pleasing to Him. That's one of the two basic questions that we need to answer as Christians. But let's suppose for a second that we have a clear and sharp understanding of divine principles, and we know with certainty what it is that God requires of us. That certainly cuts through all of the anxiety that we often experience when we're not sure what the right thing is. That's only half the battle. The second problem we face as Christians seeking to live life according to righteousness and according to standards of ethics is to have the moral power and or the ethical courage to do what we know to be true. Let me ask you this very practical question. Do you always do what you know is the right thing to do? You don't have to answer it because I know the answer before you utter it. If you're a human being and you participate in that same uh, category of humanness that I do, then I know that none of us 
always and consistently does what we know we are supposed to be doing. So there are two basic problems, knowing the good, and then once knowing the good, having the moral courage to do what is right. Now, when we look at the first part of that problem, and this is where we're going to be principally concerned in this course, and that is in understanding what it is that we ought to be doing. When we look at that half of the problem, understanding righteousness, knowing what the principles are that God approves and enjoins for His people. We often encounter persons who look at these issues of ethics in a very simplistic vein. And you've heard it said, maybe you've said it yourself about a certain person, that that person always thinks in terms of black and white, and there's no such thing as gray for that person. And usually, the individual in view is one who is, uh, is considered shallow and rigid and unbending in his moralistic approach to things, and most significantly, such a person who is described as, as looking at everything either black or white, with no gray levels, is generally considered to be someone who is simplistic. And indeed, that is often the case. But with our impatience and with our discomfort with those who seem so brittle and seem so rigid and so judgmental to us that everything has to be black or white, that sometimes we want to put a, an entire judgment upon anyone who thinks sharply and acutely about ethical principles and sort of uh, baptize and celebrate the confusion of the gray. Let me illustrate that for a minute. I've brought a little cardboard uh, prop with me. It's not exactly the, of the graphic style of Sesame Street, but it's a simple enough graphic that you can see there that I have a rectangular shape here on this blue piece of paper. And on this end, we see this last square, very dark, and the square on the right extremity is clear. It's light. It's bright. And in the middle, I have or, uh, uh, lines drawn through here to shade in that area so that I have three squares along this line. What this little graphic represents is what I call the ethical continuum. The ethical continuum. And we can talk on the left end of the uh, spectrum here that this dark area represents that which is evil, that which is unrighteous, ungodly, that which is sin, which God forbids. And we'll let the right end of the continuum indicate righteousness and godliness and goodness. And in the center square, I've shaded it in to indicate what we call the gray areas of ethics. So here we have our black, our white, and our gray. Now, there are different ways of talking about gray areas in ethics. On the one hand, the gray may stand for what the Bible calls matters of behavior that are audiophorous. Audiophorous. And audiophorous behavior has to do with external things that in and of themselves carry no particular ethical weight. What we would call morally neutral matters. Now, there's a lot of debate about this in Christian circles and among theologians. One school of thought says that there are many things about which the Bible says nothing, and they should certainly be left to that uh, freedom of conscience that every Christian enjoys in the practice of his liberty. That there is such a thing as Christian liberty, where we have 
aspects of our society of which the Bible says nothing that we are free to take or leave. On the other hand, there are those who argue very strenuously that there is nothing neutral under the sun, that everything that we do, the Bible says, we are to do to the glory of God, so that every one of my thoughts, every one of my actions is called into captivity to Christ, and so that nothing that I do is without ethical bearing. Now, is there a sense in which both of those positions can be true? Well, certainly not totally, but I think to a degree. I certainly am sympathetic with that side of the theological debate that says so strenuously that everything that we do is to be done to the glory of God. The Bible is clear in setting forth that as a principle for us. But on the other hand, the Bible also tells us that certain things in and of themselves are adiophorous. Meat offered to idols in and of themselves had no ethical bearing whatsoever. But what we do with the meat offered unto idols is what God is concerned about. Playing ping pong is not prohibited nor commanded by Holy Scripture. And playing ping pong in and of itself is basically morally neutral. But a person could become addicted to ping pong playing to the end that he neglects all of his daily responsibilities because he's forever at the ping pong table. At that t at, in that person's lives, ping pong is a problem. It has now moved from adiaphora to sin. And so the gray covers those areas where the Bible neither affirms nor denies in and of themselves they are neutral. But more importantly for us, that gray area represents what I call the area of ignorance or the area of confusion that exists in our minds about ethical principles and about the right and the wrong. I hear the complaints about people for whom everything is black or white, but when it comes to ethical judgments, I am entirely convinced that in the mind of God, there is no confusion. There are no gray areas with respect to moral issues. And that everything that I do of a moral nature, apart from the audiophorous dimension that I've already excluded, Everything that I do of an ethical character either pleases God or it does not please God. Now, the reason why I have a gray area is that because I'm not always sure where that precise line of demarcation occurs. This line that I've drawn through the middle of the graph, that line divides righteousness from unrighteousness, godliness from ungodliness, good from evil. And when I say that we're dealing with an ethical continuum, what I mean to suggest is this that there are many ethical problems that we face every day that are not easy to pigeonhole. We know, for example, that stealing, according to the Bible, is plainly wrong. We also know that charity, the voluntary giving of our gifts to the poor, is obviously good. So both Activities involve a transfer of property, a redistribution of wealth. And when Christians get together, if you ask a Christian, if you ask ten Christians, is it a good thing to steal? Generally speaking, they're going to say what? No, of course not. That's plainly sin. Well, is it a good thing to give alms to the poor? Why, yes, that's charity. That's a wonderful thing. Well, what about if we use income taxes where the government takes money from one group of people and dispenses it to another group of people. Here we have a transfer of wealth by force by one group to another group. Is that good or evil? That's when we begin to scratch our heads. That's when we begin to wonder, ooh, maybe it's not quite so easy to discern whether such a practice is right 
moving in the direction of charity, or is wrong moving in the direction of theft? Look at it another way. We see that so often evil is nothing more and nothing less than things that were created good gone wrong. We're often involved in seminars dealing with labor and management relationships in the industrial world in, terms, in connection with the program called The Value of the Person. And as I talk to businessmen, I often hear them use this particular metaphor to describe their daily lives in the workplace. They say, the corporate world is like a jungle. And when I hear that, my antennae go up and I say, wait a minute, it's a jungle. The original environment in which God placed his creatures, man and woman, the original workplace, the original environment for productivity and for industry was not a jungle, but a garden, a garden of paradise. And I say, here God made man and put him in a garden and put him to work in a garden, and now people are saying that they are working not in a garden, but in a jungle. So I ask the question, what's the difference? What's the difference between a garden and a jungle? Both have vegetation. It's a place where things grow. The basic difference is a jungle is a garden run amok, a garden run wild, a garden in chaos, something good that has moved along the line and crossed the border into evil. Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, said that the most fundamental aspect of human nature is what he described as man's intrinsic and inherent will to power. That man has a lust for conquest. And if we're to understand mankind, we have to measure man's actions in terms of this primordial and fundamental passionate consuming drive to conquer other people. And this accounts for the violence and the, and the bloodshed and the warfare that has marred the pages of the history of civilization. The will to power. We know that a lust for dominance, a lust for power, is sin. And yet, if we examine the biblical concept of man, we see that God built into man an aspiration for significance an inner drive and desire for a meaningful existence. And that's good. But you take that which is good and let it be distorted, it crosses the line. Well, you see, once it gets across the line and goes to the extreme realm of evil, it's plain to us and simple to us that it is wrong. But it's when it's still in this intermediate area that we are puzzled. John Murray, the great teacher of ethics, made this statement, and I'd like to leave you this week with this concept to think about for the next few days. Murray said this, that ultimately the difference between right and wrong is rarely an unbridgeable chasm, but more often is the razor's edge. And you see, unless we have the tools of divine revelation, the multiple principles that God gives to us, how are we ever going to be able to discern that acute, thin line between righteousness and wickedness? You see, the Bible doesn't just give us one principle or two principles, but many principles. And the more principles that we learn, the better our understanding of ethics is, the more the gray of confusion can be removed from our heads as we seek to apply God's principles to our lives.